in going to college, the first thing you want to do is have a plan. Moms and dads who are here without their kids, your kids need to make the plan. You, you can't make the plan. They're leaving you. Um, kids, you got to make the plan. <clears throat> and I'm going to give you some guidance on how to do that plan because this is really how we succeed in college. First, how are you going to spend your time? And, and also, what about studying? <laughs> and who do you want to connect with? Who do you want to spend your time with? What do you want to learn? All of this is the kind of stuff you want to be thinking about when you're going to college. But you also need to allow for that plan to evolve as necessary and as needed. Myself, as an example, I went to college um, because my best friend went to college. <laughs> like I went to UMass Amherst and I applied to two schools for undergrad, Bridgewater State and UMass Amherst. And the reason I applied to those two schools was because my sisters both went to Bridgewater State and my best friend was planning to go to UMass because that was where his in-laws lived. Or I'm sorry, his grandparents lived. I didn't have a plan. I didn't know what I was doing, right? I was just kind of going and doing what I could with the very limited guidance I had. Um, I, give me one second here. I have to yell at my kid by text message. Um, cause I can't think police have them stop banging period. My apologies. The 12 year olds right above me. Um, but so you want to have this plan. You want to know what you're going to do. I was a person who didn't. And I took me five years to get out of college. Not surprisingly. <clears throat> Another way that college is different from high school is you're a differently sized fish in a differently sized pond. I don't want to say you're like going from a big fish in a small pond to a small fish in a big pond. Cause I don't know what size fish your kid is, or you are, or you you as the kid are in high school, you might feel like a small pond, small fish in a big pond, even in high school, you're just going to go to college and be a different sized fish in a different sized pond. And there's going to time be times when that feels really isolating. <clears throat> and there's going to be times when that feels really amazing. Just know it's going to be different. Be thinking about how you're going to spend your time in college. This is where success lies, is figuring out what to do with your time. How much time are you going to devote to studying? versus socializing, versus perhaps a job, versus self-care, versus chores, which is sort of self-care, versus traveling to and from places. You got to think about all this stuff, which is not something you necessarily have to think about right now. When we go to school in high school, it's like seven to three or ish, right? 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. I'm in school. They tell me what to do and I go and do it. That is not how college works. I made a little mock college schedule here. I'm going to zoom in on it so we can see it a little better. 8 a.m., nothing. 9 a.m., nothing. 10 a.m., now I'm finally taking some classes, right? And I kind of jammed myself a little bit. So biology on Monday, mathematics, one, two, three. On Tuesday, biology 101 again on Wednesday, and then math again on Thursday. Typically with colleges, the Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes are shorter. The Tuesday, Thursday classes are longer. And I did biology. And then there's like a biology lab over here on Fridays that is a big hour and a half monster. And then we also have History 101 at noon on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. That's about 45 minutes, fairly typical for college classes. And we have this hour and a half great works of literature class that we're also taking on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then we have the history of film on Friday from five to eight. And that's the whole class. We just take that one class that day or that one in the week. So this is my mock school schedule. And then I was like, maybe, maybe you have a work study. Maybe you're doing 20 hours at the dining commons, like the cafeteria place. So we got, you know, four hours in the evening and then another five over here to try to get that or another four over here to try to get that time done, right? This is our work study. There's a lot of empty space in the schedule and you have to figure out what you're going to do with it. 
because it's anything can happen <laughs> in these holes, right? You can just go play video games the whole time. You can go sit outside the whole time. You can make out with your girlfriend or boyfriend the whole time. You can watch TV or sleep. You can get into more problematic behaviors involving drugs, drugs and alcohol. You need to know that this is going to happen. That these empty time slots are going to occur. And you need to figure out how that's going to affect you, right? Like you got to be up to get to work at 8 a.m. on Saturday. What does that mean about these other days? Are you a person who has to wake up at 7 a.m. every day if you're going to get up at 7 a.m. on Saturday? And if that's the case, what are you going to do for these two hours? How are you going to spend that time? And what about Friday where you've got this big, huge window? You're not doing anything till noon. And also, I intentionally ruined your ability to have lunch at a regular time. Because that happens, right? Like you're not going to eat lunch at noon because you got a class. Maybe at 11, but that gets wrecked here. So maybe 1130, I don't know. And what happens when you go to class on Saturday or go to work on Saturdays? And now you can't eat lunch in the dining commons, probably. So your schedule is going to be wacky. If you're someone who really likes a consistent daily schedule and that has been helpful for you in high school, that's going to get blown up in college. No matter how hard you try, it's going to get blown up. So you have to make your own consistent regular schedule and learn how to adapt. Another piece of this that is important to know is, and feel free to comment in the chat if you've got questions or concerns or thoughts as we go, because I feedback is helpful for me. So a little bit of like, yay or boo would be pleasant. Um, but another thing to know is that in college, they're trying to weed you out of your major, depending on what it is. Like psychology, which is where I started, English, engineering, computer science. These are majors that like lots and lots of kids go into. And they don't want lots and lots of kids in it. So the initial classes can be pretty challenging in order to get kids to drop out of those majors and change to another one or potentially drop out of school. They don't necessarily want kids dropping out of college, but if you can't hack the engineering program, they don't want you in the engineering program because in the long run, kids doing poorly in the engineering program reflects poorly on that program. And so they want the best of the best, they, or at least the good of the best. They don't want the kids who aren't going to take it seriously. That's why a lot of the early classes are kind of intimidating and overwhelming. You're probably going, unless you go to a really small school, you're probably going to end up in a class that has a lot of people in it, maybe 50, maybe a hundred. I went to classes with like 150 kids in them, like huge lecture halls. And I didn't feel like I mattered in those classes. And that's part of the weed out process is who's going to do, take the steps necessary to make it feel like they matter, to make it feel like they're there and of significance. And that's where we start filling in some gaps in the schedule is with studying, with connecting to our professors and that kind of stuff. And we're going to, we're going to loop around and circle over to that. Um, the other piece to this, right? Like the other piece here, this traveling to and from, that's kind of a big deal. And here's why. Um, this is UMass Amherst. This is the map of UMass Amherst. Let's see if I can get it to work, to cooperate with me. Yeah, there we go. So hopefully you can see this. Down here, where is it? This, where the dot is, right? This right here where my cursor is, that's where I lived. I lived in John Adams Tower at UMass. I had classes. Most of my classes were in Bartlett and Goodell, if I'm being honest, over here. But I had classes that were like way over here. And and that's insanity. Like I was taking um, anthropology courses up here in Guinness and Marston. And like just it's the other side of campus. It's a mile away. And you have to know where your classes are, even just in scheduling them. Because right here, History 101 and Biology Lab, 
there's a 15 minute gap between those classes. So depending on what school you go to, you better make sure you can get from one class to another in the amount of time that you have to get from one class to another. And you have to travel there on purpose and intentionally. Because I know I didn't always do that. Sometimes I was like heading to class and then I saw someone I knew and I was like, blah, 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 blah. Let's hang out and talk and not go to class or not get to class on time. And I was kind of the kid who, if I was going to be late to class, I might not go because it was embarrassing to walk into class late. And I wish that I had someone like me who taught me to factor that into my plan. If I can't handle walking into class late or I have a professor who's not going to sit up, be okay with that, I need to know what I'm going to do to manage that if I have to be late one day. Um, so that get to know your campus, master the campus, know where everything is, including because when we have this schedule and we're trying to figure out what to do with our time, right? You want to know where you can go because if your plan is to go back to your dorm room way over here when all the class stuff is deep in the middle where my cursor is spinning, that doesn't work. You can't go back to class or I'm sorry, you can't go back to your dorm room with any degree of consistency. You've got to know where on campus you can be instead. And this is what campus tours are for. This is what visiting the campus in advance is for. This is what trying to get on campus a day or two before even even registering for or, or move-in day can be helpful. Know where to go to get food for lunch, to study in a quiet space where no one's going to be bugging you, or to study with friends because they're nearby. Get to know your campus. In, in this case, I know this campus because I went here. Like I said, I'd kind of come up this way. I'll zoom in a little bit. I would go from John Adams and I was, I was in this area a lot of the time, right? And so the library was right there. And I would, I would go from Herder to, to, to the library, or I'd find an empty classroom in Herder too, which is another thing you can do is track down empty classrooms and use those. But sometimes I needed to be somewhere else. And in, the, in good weather, I'd go to the campus pond and hang out there and try to study if it was doable. Sometimes there's like people playing Frisbee and stuff and that made it hard. But even that, I eventually learned this side of the pond was busier than this side of the pond. So if I hung over here, it was usually okay. And I found like secret hidey holes behind the fine arts center where I could sit and be outside and do my homework or read a book. And, and that is just strategies you want to have. You want to have an idea about what to do with that stuff. And eventually, if you have a really cool school, you find out that there are tunnels underneath buildings from one building to another. And that is awesome. Because I could go from Bartlett to Herder to the Fine Arts Center and never step above ground. I'm pretty sure it was Bartlett to, the, to Herder. And never have to go outside, <laughs> right? Because there were tunnels underground and there were like elevated walkways and stuff. And that's useful when it's raining or cold. So get to know all that stuff and talk to your friends and your peers as you get to school and find out what are those things that are cool to do. So what about studying? Let me fix my slides here. I apologize for that. I forgot I was zoomed in as tight as I was. Something about having ADHD. First off, what, what will you study? What is your major going to be, right? And then when are you going to study? Where are you going to study? And how are you going to study? We're back to this, right? We're back to this calendar. And we're back to the map because between biology and history, that's an hour and a half. You can study. You can go to wherever you need to go for your next class and get some studying in all in that hour and a half. And in here, that's like a three hour window. Check that out. That's enough time to go back to your dorm room if you want, but your dorm room is going to suck you in. Maybe there might be a video game system there. There might be like friends on your floor. You might not get the work done if you go back every time between these classes. You don't want to always go back to your dorm room. You might want to go to the campus center or, or the library or something like that. The student union. There are places on campus to go that you can be studying or find an empty classroom like I mentioned earlier. There usually is an empty classroom in every building at least every, almost every time. They're pretty easy to find. And then when it comes to studying, we talked about when and where, but also how. Are you someone who learns better in a group? Are you someone who learns better on their own? Do you need your books to be read out loud? So you're doing some audiobooks. 
Do you need total silence to study? Do you need a little bit of background noise to study? What does that look like? Are you someone who highlights the pages? Are you rewriting your notes? What are you doing to study? Get an idea what that is. If you don't know, there are supports on campus that can provide you with assistance on what to do and how to study. And you can be taught how to do that because you're on your own. Like this is on you, a lot of it. It's much more than high school. And it's going to be a lot more information that you're going to have to learn all at once. I had to read, like, I would have to typically read two or three chapters in a textbook, right? For my psych classes. And I was also re reading a novel for an English class and maybe another novel and like articles for other classes too and various textbooks. So if you're taking three and four, like three, four classes, which is the typical load is four classes. That's a ton of reading. You've got to be ready for that. You have to know how you're going to do it. I can't recommend audiobooks strongly enough. Those things are awesome. I wish they were a bigger deal when I was in school because I could have been walking from one class to another, listening to an audiobook. And now that time is well spent especially because I'm a person who remembers better when I'm walking around and listening to something than when I'm sitting down and reading it. Because that combination of moving and listening helps me attend more effectively than sitting on my butt and hoping for the best. And the other way that I've learned that audiobooks are wonderful for me is sometimes if I really want to kill it with a book, if I really want to get this thing nailed down in my head, I'm doing a presentation on it for something like this that I'm doing right now, or I want to turn up, like play with some ideas for a workshop or a podcast interview. I will get the book on audio and in physical form. And I'll listen to the audio book while taking notes in the book itself and maybe on a piece of paper too. So I'm reading the paper copy of the book and I'm listening to the audio book and I might have a notebook as well for ideas that are, it's generating for me. That kind of aggressive studying I'm 43 years old. I have two master's degrees and an undergrad degree. I'm done with school. I'm still studying that aggressively sometimes. I, I read a book called Atomic Habits about a year ago and was the last time that I was that aggressive because COVID sort of rocked that for me. Um, I'm secondarily aggressive now with a book about fear um, where I'm, I'm not listening to it, but I'm still reading it and writing notes and all that kind of stuff. Be aggressive. B E aggressive cheerleading. Nobody, nothing. I can't tell if you guys are finding me humorous or not. There's no feedback. Um, except that some of you like atomic habits. So, so be ready with that. Those thoughts about studying. How am I going to do it? What am I going to do with it? When am I going to do it? Where am I going to do it? And don't go home. Don't go back to your dorm room, find the library, find the empty classrooms. I can't recommend that highly enough. That's why I keep it circling back to it. I know you guys see the next picture coming, so I'm just going to call it up. Who do you want to connect with? This is kind of moving away from the academics. But who do you want to connect with? You're going to college. It's not only about academics. It's also about social stuff. It's also about like, you know, parties and friends and those kinds of things. So connect with people who can help you as well as those who are fun to hang out with. Don't only hang out with people who are fun to hang out with. Yes, spend time with them, but not just them. Find friends who share your interests first off. When, when, you move, when you go to college and you move in, you're like immediately connected to everybody on your floor, like the floor of your dorm room. And if it's a big, long dorm, big, long floor, it might just be like a certain wing or something that at first. But... But connecting with them is quick and you're all, it's almost like trauma bonding. Like you're all like fresh and new to college and what's going on. And I don't know what's going on either. And you kind of like connect with each other through that stuff. But that doesn't mean that that has to be your crew for the rest of the four years. There's probably other people who have more in common with you. So find them. Don't be locked into friends due to geography. Like you've been all through high school. The only reason you have friends in high school is because they live near you and you've known them since elementary school, right? Like that's why that happens. College can do the same thing, but it doesn't have to. There are in the same way that you found stuff in common with people through clubs in high school, you can do that in college and you can do it immediately. 
So go track down those clubs that have things that you like. Even the stuff that you like, don't want anyone to know that you're into in high school, right? Like if you're a big Dungeons and Dragons player and that's not cool yet in college, like just go sign up for the D and D club, go let your freak flag fly, right? Be a geek. I played D and D in college. That's kind of where I found the game. And some of my best friends still to this day came out of that game because I engaged in that activity. Right. And, and the same is true for intramural sports or a business club or outdoors stuff like find the stuff that you dig, track it down in college, join those clubs and also sign up for clubs that you don't know if you're going to like or not and try it out for a month, six months, a semester. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work bounce. But if it works fantastic, keep doing that thing that you've just found as a new hobby or a new passion. Just don't feel like you're stuck on that floor the whole time. You don't have to be with those floor people which doesn't mean you shouldn't connect with them because like they're probably cool people. It's good to know them, but they don't have to be your best friends. If they are your best friends, awesome. More the better. But I, I know when I went, the floor I was on was full of people who just wanted to party and that is not my jam. Never was. So I didn't connect with them as well. I had to find other people later and I'm encouraging you to do it. Don't party. You have ADHD. It'll take over and you'll lose college. Fair warning. Partying is not a good choice when you have ADHD because you're already distracted and you're already not performing as well as you could. And you already would rather do the fun thing than the responsible thing, right? Like, come on, I've got ADHD. I know how this works. Instead, focus on the, the academics and let the partying and the social stuff and the boyfriends and the girlfriends and all that stuff, let that sh bubble up later. The beginning of college in a lot of schools is like immediately go to a frat party on day one and yay. I mean, go, but don't feel like that needs to be your deal. Also, uh, don't trust everybody right away either. I was a resident assistant when I was in UMass. I was an RA. And I heard all kinds of war stories about kids who got taken advantage of from the jump because they were meeting new people all over the place. And they would just let people come into their room on like day one. And, hey, yeah, no, come in. It's awesome. I'm so glad to meet you because everyone's excited to be meeting everybody. And some of those people you're meeting are not trustworthy. I, I know there are kids on my floor who lost. Uh, one kid lost a laptop when that was a much bigger deal than it is now. Another kid lost their checkbook. So just like be a little careful, right? Like, Go into other people's room instead of bringing them into yours, for example. And, and I also like, there were kids in my dorm room who were trusting people when I was an RA who like burned them later. There's just a lot of really secret, sensitive information getting shared. Like this person has been your best friend for 20 years and you're only 18. And then that blew up later. So be, be careful with what you're sharing. I mean, share, talk about yourself. Be friendly. I'm not saying don't be friendly, but the stuff that like the soft, squishy bits, maybe wait a month or two, maybe wait until second semester to go to the soft, squishy bits. And certainly keep your checkbook like locked away, you know, like the iPad, the iPhone, the laptop, like when there's a bunch of people on your floor that you don't know, put those somewhere else. Medication as well. Thank you. Um, keep the medication locked. No one needs to know you have medication if you're an ADHD kid. Nobody needs to know that that is there, including your potentially your roommate. Because that's a thing that people are going to be like, ooh, I want some of that. So keep that stuff locked away and secure. And maybe even talk to the school about how to do that. Other social stuff, like network with your peers and your professors. And I don't necessarily mean friendly networking, like be friendly, but I'm not looking for friends here. I'm looking for connections. I'm looking for a network. So that as I grow up and I graduate from college, I have a professional network that can help me get a job. Do professional networking. Get to know what people are interested in. What are they doing? Where are they heading? Is that a, something that you might be useful for you to know later? 
connect to the people who are going places and are, and are, and are going to be successful. Those are the ones you want to be connected to the kid. That's like drinking all day and not going to classes. They're not necessarily worth knowing. They might not make it out of college and they're not going to help you 10 years from now when you need a job, but the ones that are striving and trying their best, those are the ones you want to know. Even if they're struggling, even if it's another ADHD kid, who's like, you know, they're trying their best, but they're not hitting success yet. We ADHD people do some cool stuff and we're good to know as long as we're not self-destructive. And then another social thing that might feel academic, but is also social is meet with your professors during their office hours. Oh my God, meet with your professors during their office hours. Even if you struggle to self-advocate, go there and do that and talk to them. Because when you meet with your professors during their office hours, it keeps you top of mind. It keeps you in their thoughts. Because your professor doesn't know who you are if you don't go to their office hours. They have oh, more students than they can handle, probably. Every now and then you got some that are not tapped out, but a lot of them are tapped out. If you're going to their office hours, they know your name, they know your face. So when they see your name on an assignment or a test, they know what face that goes with. And critically, they know that you care and that you're trying. And if you're struggling, as many of us ADHD folks do, sometimes knowing that you're trying is the difference between a B and a C, a C and a D. They're trying so they can pad that. So be ready and go. Because uh, here's the deal. A lot of your professors don't care. They're not here to hold your hand and help you get through college. You have to make them want to hold your hand and help you get through college. And the way to do that is to go to office hours and get to know your professors. If you don't do that, they're not going to help you get through college. And if they're not going to help you get through college, they're not going to help you get a job later either, which is really what college is all about. So especially the, co the professors in your major get to know them, go to those office hours, but professors in general. I had a professor, I got, I worked at Kitchen Sink Press. I worked at a comic book publishing company and in their warehouse when I was in college. Comic book publishing company. Pretty cool. It's pretty good stuff. Because I got to know my professor and he worked there and then he got me an internship. And got me a job in the warehouse and I got a whole bunch of free comics because they were damaged and they couldn't sell them. They were just like, take whatever you want. And that's like, maybe not that exciting for all, for some of you, most of you probably, but there's other versions of that. <coughs> I have a client who got to go to uh, Indonesia on a, like some sort of like biology trip and, and uh, environmental stuff. Because she got to know a professor. Pretty awesome. And and finally, like life, learn some life skills as well as some academic skills while you're doing this college stuff. So there's a lot of stuff in college you've got to figure out how to do. You have to learn how to talk to people that you don't know, which is not really a thing you have to do in high school. You, like, yeah, you might have to talk to like a random teacher that you just met, but you're going to have a relationship with them. A lot of these stuff, like you just have to do it. So you're kind of thrown in, in college. And if you don't know how to do these things, you're just going to learn through experience. You're going to learn through trial and error. And that is not always fun, right? That can be hard. So if any of these are like, oh my God, how do I do that? That's overwhelming. There are people who can teach those skills. Mom and dad are a great option. Maybe not a comfortable one, but they know how to do that stuff because they're probably doing it especially if they're here, right? Like if they pointed you in this direction, then they know how to do some of this. But also even just YouTube can teach you this stuff or a coach. That's what one of the things I do is teach people how to do this. I teach people how to like navigate this calendar stuff that I showed you earlier and how to figure out the map of their college so that they know how much time it's going to take between one class and another. But I also talk to them about how to, how to network and how to get to know people they don't know. What do you do when you're in a room full of a whole bunch of people you don't know and you have to mingle and chat? 
Oh, it's hard, but there's ways to do it. And, and how do you cook and clean and all that stuff? There's a limit to how important cooking is at you at, at college. Cause like there's usually a dining common area that they cook for you, but sometimes you get to learn how to cook. You get to start putting some recipes together. If you haven't been doing that at home, you've got to learn how. So maybe you take a cooking class. They're often offered in the, a lot of colleges have like continuing education classes that they do. And some of them are only one night and it's like, learn how to cook for a night. Also, just read the box. You want to make some mac and cheese? Mac and cheese will teach you how to do it on the box. Just go buy a box of mac and cheese, find out what ingredients you need and make it happen with whatever stovetop is available. A lot of dorm rooms have cooking areas in them. You're also going to have to learn to manage your time, which I talked about, that calendar thing I showed you. You haven't had to manage your time in the way you're going to have to in college, not yet. But, but starting to use a calendar now will help you when you get to college. And then manage your energy too. Try to learn when it is that you're exhausted. If you're no good before nine o'clock in the morning, don't sign up for the 730 class, right? If you're no good after five o'clock, don't sign up for the six o'clock class. Even though it seems cool and exciting to be able to take a class at six o'clock because that means you can sleep until noon. It might not be a good choice. <coughs> Excuse me. And maybe you learned that you kind of can't study between classes. Maybe you need a little bit of a break in between. That's good to know. Just don't make that the story before you've even tried because probably you can study between classes. And then find out what your passions are. Find out how to use them. What, what is it that lights you up and makes you excited? And how can you take advantage of those passions and, and apply those to your profession after you're done with college? And maybe apply those to what you're studying in college. At UMass, I designed my own major. I majored in comic books because I could. And that was my passion at the time because they let me design my own major. And I, that's what got me through college. I might've dropped out otherwise. And then finally, you got to learn how to self-advocate. You got to learn how to ask for stuff and say, hey, I need help with this. Hey, I'm struggling because y'all have ADHD. That's why you're here. So you have an IEP or a 504. And that means you're covered by the Americans with Disabilities Act. When you're done with, call, with high school, that IEP will become a 504. And that means that you can go to the Office of Disability Services. Go there, get to know the Office of Disability Services. Talk to them. Let them know you have ADHD. Even if you want to make it without have an ADHD and want to pretend that you don't have it and you want to beat the world and show everyone you can do it. Great. I fully support that plan. Also talk to the office of disability services as soon as you get to campus and let them know you have ADHD. Cause if something goes wrong, that is out of your control, you're going to want to be able to leverage that. And if you don't let them know, you can't leverage it. Even something as simple as like, you go to school and then I don't know, your, your grandfather passes away or something. And now you're, you gotta be home for a week to do the funeral. And then you come back and you're behind and you're also kind of emotionally distraught. It's hard to get motivated to start doing the homework that you're behind on. And the next thing you know, you're not a week behind, you're two weeks behind. And then you're three weeks behind. You want to be able to go to the office of disability services and go, Hey, I was doing fine. And then my grandfather passed away. And I had to go home for a week and now I'm three weeks behind because I've had trouble. I was overwhelmed by being a week behind and that sort of snowballed on me. You want to be able to have those conversations and the office of disability services does that. They can also teach you how to study. They can provide you with spaces to go and be that are quiet where you can study or where you can get a tutor or where you can get someone who will provide you with notes because you have trouble keeping up with the notes. They can give you notes for your classes. They can have someone in your class take notes for you. That's some of the things that the Office of Disability Services can provide you, including courses. Like if four classes a semester is too much for you, they can say like, well, you can take three and still be considered a full-time student if that's not how that college works. They can break the rules for you a little bit. So it's worth talking to them and finding out what kind of accommodations they can give. 
And also these skills, they can teach them study skills. They can teach them. It's not uncommon for that stuff to be taught in the office of disability services. The coaching stuff that I talked about, get a coach, your office of disability services probably has some, and then you don't necessarily have to pay more. Mom and dad might not have to drop $125 an hour or whatever for the, for a coach. Um, there might be some ways to get some free hours from that office. So know what those resources are and be ready to do it. And that said, uh, we're good for questions. So I will stop the slides and circle back. All right. I don't see anything in the Q and a, there was one in the chat. Um, okay. what other things can be done now to help kids prepare other than just how to start using a calendar? Like what else can parents help with so that kids are ready? Um, I want to be a little careful with how I answer this question. <laughs> first, the first thing that comes to mind is uh, stop helping. Here's why I'm saying that. This is a parent asking that question. It's not a child asking that question. So I'm guessing that the parent is here and maybe the kid isn't, or maybe the kid yeah, is dis I don't, think there's any I don't, I have no idea. Right. Yeah. And maybe, or maybe the kid is here, but is disinclined to ask that question. Like, I don't know, but it's possible, not guaranteed, but possible that this parent is sort of like over helping. Right. Um, so one way to help might be to not help that could be there, but also, um, kid is the swim practice and then gym with the dad. So never mind, your kid's a go getter. Um, but also in terms of what to help with, like the calendar is critical. The idea about managing their energy is a pretty big deal. Um, and so too is like, what are you going to do when you get to school to college and you're not known by anybody? Like there's, a, it's kind of, if depending on the kid, right? Sometimes it's nice to be like, you can be whoever you want. If you're a kid that struggles and doesn't feel like they fit in college, if you go to a big enough one, you can find your, your spot. And if you are a big kid on campus and then you're going to college, like you got to be ready for that blow to be there and be like, Oh, like nobody knows me. I don't really matter. Like I used to matter. So being ready for that is important. And also talk to your kid about like, I call it a pre-mortem. I do this all the time for everything. Whenever I have something new, new that I'm doing and I'm making a plan for it, I try to imagine why it might go critically wrong. Like, why is it going to just blow up my face? And what's, and I might start with like crazy stuff. Like, well, an asteroid could crash into me and then uh, like that is ridiculous, but I might need to start there. But what I'm really trying to get at is like my realistic reasons. What are the realistic reasons why this might blow up in my face and I might totally fail at it? And then once I have those realistic reasons, I can start planning around them and I can start trying to figure out how to accommodate them. And so I'm less likely to mess up in those ways. I might still mess up in the way that I guessed that I would mess up. Like it could still happen, but it's hopefully going to be less of a significant mess up and then something I can recover from. Um, is that, is that Tina, am I answering your question? Is that heading in the right direction? Okay. <laughs> So do you like stop doing laundry, stop cooking? Like, do you have them start? Not all at once, all but yeah, you know, like, Hey, you're going to college soon. Do your own laundry kid, you know? And then once laundry's kind of locked in, then it's like, Hey, you're making dinner every Tuesday or you're making dinner with me every Tuesday. If you're a parent that like just makes dinner and they don't, the kids don't do that, which that was my mom, like start teaching them some recipes. And what do you do if they're like against uh, starting to pick up stuff by themselves or they're against you showing them how to use a calendar and stuff like that? Um, I would have that conversation away from the moment. So if you're like, hey, let's look at the calendar, that's going to not go. That's not going to work. You got to have a conversation about looking at a calendar, about learning how to do calendars. Before you just say, I'm going to teach you, you got to be like, Hey, I went to this workshop on college and this is some stuff the guy was talking about. Hey, can I, let's talk about some stuff you need to learn. 
and and be open to them not needing to learn it. Don't assume they have to learn how to calendar. They might know how, and they just don't have to tell you that. You don't need to know that. So they don't, so you don't know because you don't deal with their schedule. I don't know. But that kind of stuff, having those conversations like outside of the moment, and this is anything, any any significantly charged conversation, have it outside of the event that is causing the significant charge so that it can be easier to have. Um, and Tina, Tina's happy that her kids have been doing laundry for years. My kids have been doing, them, doing it on and off for two years. They were doing great and then COVID hit and they backslide. I shrunk my mom's pants in sixth grade and she took away all of my jeans for a month. So I had to wear stretchy pants when they weren't cool. That's how I learned how to do laundry. Cool. <laughs> okay. If no one has other questions, I have some. Um, come on, people. <laughs> Emily, Jane, Carol, Angela, Amy, yeah, come on. Earn Laura, your Lynn, Melissa, Sue. How Trisha? long? suggest having a kid try an activity before dropping it like a whole semester because i know a lot of people like to quit early uh, i don't care they're full-grown adults in college let <laughs> go like that's my short answer right like They'll figure it out. They're going to go to college and they'll figure it out. Um, but I also understand that you want to give them some advice. Like that's cool too. Mm -hmm. Get like, just try something for a month, but it's not rigid. Like if it's, if you're miserable, don't do it. Right. Like if it sucks out loud, then don't do that. But try like when for kids, for parents of kids, like elementary school, middle school, right. For them, I say that the way to do it is like whatever activity your kid wants to do, they have to do it for longer than the last activity. So if the kid bounces like every month, they're going to a new thing. Well, then this one you did for a month, the next one you have to do for a month and a week or two months or whatever so that it builds. And then eventually if they're doing something for like three years, then okay, we're back to like, I'm not going to say the next activity has to be for three years in a month. Like that's ridiculous. At some point you reset back to zero, but, but that's a one way. That's sort of my like general rule, I guess, but that's the best I got. Cause they're, and also they're full grown adults are 18, 19 years old. They're going to figure it out. And if they don't, then you're going to stop paying for college and they're going to have to figure out life in a different way. Cause that that's all there too, right? There's risks of like pot and alcohol and, harder drugs and all that stuff and you're not there like trust that you put a good head on your kid's shoulders and trust that I'm they'll talk to you about it if it's hard that. say that again i think i'm too much of a control freak for that um so stop yeah. being a control freak <laughs> easier said than done okay so tina says what do we need to do to legally keep the 504 so that you can get accommodations in college when you finish at school, as your kid is graduating, you will be, prov you'll have like a meeting about all that stuff. And it, and the school is just going to be like, this is what's up and this is how it works. And here's your transition plan for leaving high school. And, and they'll guide you on a lot of that. Maybe not all of it, but a lot of it. Um, so you don't, you don't necessarily have to do, um, anything exactly like your kid has a diagnosed disability. So they are covered by the Americans with disabilities act. But if they don't tell anybody that they have a disability, then they're not covered <laughs> like, cause no one knows. And, and if, if it, if they don't tell people in advance, they're not going to have as much coverage. Cause it's not, and then it's like suspicious, right? It's like, Oh, what do you mean? Well, you're failing my class. Cause you didn't do any schoolwork. And it's the end of the semester. And now you're telling me that you have ADHD, like prove it is what's going to happen. And now you're scrambling to prove it because they're in Maryland, right? And you're in Illinois and maybe you can still find the paperwork from when they were 13 and got tested for ADHD. And does that paperwork even matter and count? Cause that's five years ago. And a lot of change happens between 13 and 18 
and or 19 like that stuff all has to get factored in you might need to do some retesting and that kind of stuff but your your high school guidance counseling slash special education department should be able to guide you in that um okay so another question was um what do you do when the kids aren't motivated it says unless it's a class he likes he has no interest in the class at all wondering if that will change as he gets older Um, I hope that they're going to pass the classes that they're not motivated to take. If it's that, if it's like, if it's really bad, I don't send them to college <laughs> and I give them a gap year so that they can learn how to be motivated to do stuff that they don't, they don't want to do. Right. Um, but if they're motivated enough, um, then you talk to them about going to disability services so they can get some support in the classes that they're going to struggle with. Um, you provide them with unconditional love and unconditional positive regard and acceptance that like, yeah, like you're going to, I get it. You don't like classes for like history, but you have to take two of them to cover requirements. So just do your best, like squeak by with a C call it done and then kick ass in electrical engineering. You know what I mean? Like help them figure out what's the bare minimum that they can do and still get the thing that they need to get so they can move on. Like that's, that's a totally legitimate strategy. Have you heard of this one girl was talking about the dopa dopa menu, dopamine menu for motivation? I have. Yeah. Okay. Would you that, suggest like parents look at that and kind of show their kids different like tricks for self-motivating? Yeah, I, but you want to make sure that you're doing it in a healthy way, right? Like it, like I'm at a point right now where I, I use Zelda Breath of the Wild, the video game, <laughs> to like refresh my brain. It's a way for me to get some dopamine going. But like when I was 18... No way. I could not have done that. I would have like just played Zelda Breath of the Wild all day. Cool. Yeah, I wouldn't, it wouldn't have worked. So you've got to kind of know what, what's going to work for them, what's not going to work for them. They have to be able to be honest with themselves about what will work and what won't work. Because when I was 18, I would have been like, no, nah, that'll totally work. I can manage it. Like, no, I couldn't. I wasn't responsible enough. Not a timer. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay. And I, I hate to be a jerk. I have to bounce in three minutes. Okay. Because my kid, sure. my obsessive compulsive disorder kid, for real, he's got OCD. Yeah, I do. Yeah, we're working on bedtime and and. Oh, like I totally get it. Cracking that nut right now, so I have to be kind of rigid with my nine o'clock stop. Um, says I find that students will often make what I call the sophomore switch, usually between first and second semester of sophomore year, right after sophomore year, kids start to see that they need to do what needs to get done regardless of motivation. Yeah. Maturity. And, and I would be one, I would wonder about for Tina, how many of those kids are neurotypical and how many of those kids have ADHD? Cause ADHD is a developmental disorder. So those ADHD kids might lag behind and it might be a junior senior year switch. Yeah, my sister did that. So just, and you've got a person who wants to stay on the chat after I bounce. Um, um, I actually have to end this webinar, but if you're interested, email me and maybe we'll do an ADHD parent support group through the library and you guys can chat like once a month or once a week. And, and also let me, let me throw a couple of things at you guys before I run away. If that's okay. Do you mind if I like? Yeah. And then again, if you're a teacher, um, my email is at the top. If you need CPU credits, email me and I will send you all the documentation. This is my Facebook community that I just dropped in there. Um, and then here is, and I'll draw like a line to separate these things or whatever. Oh, um, <clears throat> And then I recently did a webinar for Attitude Magazine on teen stress and family connection and that kind of stuff. I think I that's, watched that one. Oh, yay. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, so that's there. And then the podcast that you can find on your podcast player of choice. 
is called ADHD Essentials. Um, um, and I will send everyone copies of these links. So if you don't get it in the chat box before we close out, um, then you will get it in email. Maybe yeah. I can stay on and then you could go off and it'll still be open. We'll try that. Yeah. And this is my e my website in case people want, want that. And you can get to the podcast that way too. So thank you very much, everybody. I hope that this was helpful and useful and got you. what you needed. And I'll see everybody. Maybe never because you live in Illinois and I live in Massachusetts. But have a good no, rest of your you day. <laughs> um, so toodaloo. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you.